So I'm Stuart Breck. I don't have any funny stories to tell about myself, so we'll jump right into this. And if you look at the sketch, yeah, Don has, there's a lot of you that have funny stories about me, but anyway, we're running short on time, so we'll just keep going, right? Um, so the title of my talk is Development of an Urban Coyote Culture in the Denver, Denver Metro Area. And you're probably thinking, I thought you were going to talk about coyote behavior. I'm getting there. So we were tasked in 2009 or back in the past, are coyotes in the Denver metro area bolder or more aggressive? And on a very simple uh, level, the answer is, of course, we have common encounters, coyotes trailing people, coyotes attacking people. So uh, why is my talk 30 minutes? Maybe we should stop it here. This is really actually a complex question, okay? And as an example of that, is this coyote bolder or more aggressive? Well, the first thing you might want to ask is, bolder than what? More aggressive than what? Is context important? How do coyotes become bolder? Are all, are all urban coyotes bolder and more aggressive? Do they learn or is it genetic? What about other behaviors? How do we measure this? So uh, it is a very complex question. And the way I am wrapping this complexity, I'm wrapping it under one word, and that is culture. OK, so my objectives are to introduce this concept. We're going to explore the process for the development of culture, uh, urban culture and coyotes, and examine data for and against urban culture. And then I'll talk about management implications at the end of this symposium. So if you think any of my comments are insightful, um, we have to, I have to acknowledge uh, a number of people that have helped with discussion, understanding coyote behavior. It's a very hard question to get at. So who is the genius? Uh, it's definitely not me, probably not them, and uh, yeah, it's probably this animal. Um, so what is culture? Culture is simply variation in behavior generated by learning and maintained within different societies. All right, let's break that down just a little bit. So variation behavior could be different behaviors, bold versus shy, and within that behavior type, you have this variation. You have bold to shy individuals. Um, it could be aggressive or submissive. It could be risk prone or risk averse. It could be other behaviors. All right, and so what we're gonna argue today is that in these different societies, and what the better word is, is different landscapes. We have the rural landscape and the urban landscape you're gonna see these different cultures emerge within, uh, the coy within coyotes. And within that culture is, again, all these behaviors. So the hypothesis is that in urban areas, humans have become less relevant to coyotes. And this has resulted in an urban coyote culture. And one of the results is that bolder and more aggressive behaviors towards people and pets are inevitable outcomes. So there's our hypothesis. So you're probably thinking, culture and coyotes, really? Well, you wouldn't hesitate to compare, to say there's two different cultures, an uh, urban culture and a, a rural culture in the United States. If we go into the animal kingdom, there's good examples of culture emerging in a lot of different animals, uh, from chimpanzees to gorillas to cetaceans, even the birds. So what are the components that drive development of culture in coyotes? I'm going to argue three things. First, you need individual variation in coyote behavior. We've touched on that. Um, you need an ecological process that impacts learning. And there's, I'm going to talk about two important ones, habituation and intergild predation. Intergild predation, for those of you who have forgotten uh, ecology 101 like I had, um, it's basically predation and competition mixed together. Okay. Um, and then we need variation in what the predator is doing, the predator behavior, in this case, humans. So let's go into those three points in a little more detail. So variation in coyote behavior. Marianne talked a lot about this. I'm going to kind of skim over it pretty quickly, but I want to just show you um, one of our trials in captive situation. Um, it involves a food, um, element of food put in the corner of a, of a pin and protected by a scare device. And then we measured number of activations and approaches 
by a number of different individuals. And here's, here's what we have um, on this graph. All these different symbols are different individuals. And here we have days till the, till the coyote got to the food, and then number of activations by the scare device. What we see is some coyotes uh, went into the scare device right away, didn't care how many times it went off, and things exploding, and they don't care. They go right in and get the food. On the other end of the spectrum is coyotes that never got the food. The trial ended at 30 days. We call these shy individuals, these bold individuals. You can label them in different ways. But you get the point here, a lot of individual variation in coyotes' behavior. So in uh, ecological processes that impact learning, a big one is, um, is predation. And the best way to uh, demonstrate this is, and Sharon's going to help me get this video started, is uh, with an example from Yellowstone. And here we have, not starting. This so here we have what we call an old coyote mistake. going in on a kill made by a wolves. Okay? This is an example from a program nature uh, titled In the Valley of Wolves, footage by Bob Landis. Um, and see, the point I want to make here is that predation both selects and teaches. And you're going to feel really sorry for this coyote. Right. Flush with their new power. Stop. Okay. Well, we'll uh, the, the end of this video was that the wolves attacked and killed the coyote. Okay. And so this time, uh, it's a terrible uh, mistake. Just, just stop. Uh, it's pretty brutal. And the point is, yes, predation both selects and teaches. So it's real clear how it selects, right? We've got a bold individual predation on that bold individual. How does it teach? Well, coyotes are a very social animal. And so they, um, they're watching each other. So the teaching involved in this case is the other pack members seeing this happen, right? They see this happen like, OK, I'm not messing with wolves' food source anymore. So that's the teaching, OK? What about humans as predators of coyotes? We know in urban areas versus rural areas, there's, there's real contrasting elements of the social complex of what people believe and the attitudes and values, the th things that uh, Andrew and Tara talked about. In urban areas, we have little hunting, no trapping, little lethal management. The social tolerance for coyotes is high versus rural areas where we have basically the opposite. So the human behavior towards coyotes in urban areas, and, and how does habituation fit into this? So I'm using this caricature as, as uh, an indication of passive human behavior, OK? And this one here is, uh, that you can hardly see is maybe aggressive human behavior. And I've made this really small because in urban areas, we don't see a lot of aggressive behaviors relative to coyotes. What we see is more of this, this type of behavior. And it's this ratio between the passive and the aggressive behaviors toward coyotes that's real important in the process of habituation. The more people we have that are passive or submissive or don't uh, uh, um, um, act aggressively towards coyotes, coyotes learn from that. And that's the process of habituation. So I'm going to go into this hypothetical scenario here. And this is hypothetical, but it's an important graph. And I want to go through it. You'll see it a number of times today. So. Um, First, on this, on this y-axis, we have shy versus bold. Um, and with the increasing, uh, as we go up, uh, increasing in, in bold behavior. This could be an, any other a number of different behaviors. But uh, I just put shy and bold in here uh, for demonstration. And then on the x-axis, we have um, increasing through time, from 1980s through the 2000s. And we can hypo hypothetically say this is Denver metro area. Okay. The other thing we have is you'll notice these bars kind of trending upward, OK? So let me go into a little bit more detail and explain what this, uh, what this is. This is a bar graph. And so what this represents, this colored portion, is that that's going to be, say, 75% of your, your coyote population. And they're going to exhibit this, this, this type of uh, uh, shy, bold behavior with the median right here. 
The rest of the coyote pulp population is going to be between these air bars. So this shows you the variation in the behavior, but it shows you where most of the coyotes are. And then the circles here are the, the very occasional outliers, okay? Let's just, uh, let's, let's pretend that um, in the 1980s, these were the urban pioneers. These were the, pi the, the coyotes that started coming into Denver, and they had this type of behavioral profile. As we move through time, what do coyote, coyotes are very good at reproducing, and they produce lots of, of young. And, and um, I'm going I'm to speculate that the ones that were doing the most reprodu reproducing were individuals in this, in this area, the bold, the, the, the bolder coyotes. Um, and why would that be? Well, the bold coyotes are going to be the first ones to get more comfortable around people. They're going to be the ones that are able to penetrate further into higher density urban areas. And so what do they do? They pass on their behavior to their young. There's social learning involved. There's uh, experiential learning involved where they have this process of habituation. They're getting more comfortable with people. They pass it on to the next generation. And so we still have this variation in behavior, but it's, it's bumped up a level. And so we go through time and we keep bumping up, okay? Key points here, bold individuals learn faster about people. They're rewarded with new food sources and they're more likely to transfer behavior. So now I'm gonna talk about behavioral thresholds. And I'm not talking about a threshold for a coyote, I'm talking about for people. And so um, I'm putting up a different y-axis just to demonstrate that we can talk a lot about different behaviors, in this case, aggressiveness. And here again, we have more up higher, less aggressive coyotes uh, down lower. Um, but the, the behavioral threshold we can say is, well, this coyote's attacking pets. And we can say that, all right, that's a threshold for us in which we do something different. And so the, what I'm demonstrating here is in the 1980s, you didn't see any coyotes attacking pets in this hypothetical situation. Um, as we move forward through time into the 90s, we might have occasional individuals that are attacking pets, but as we move forward into the 2000s, it's becoming more common. We can put another threshold of coyotes attacking people. And here in the 1980s and 90s, we didn't see any of that, but then we get into the 2000s, it becomes, the, um, uh, it becomes plausible that coyotes start attacking people. We got, you know, they are the, the extreme individuals in that behavioral type, but, um, it does happen. And so this kind of matches what we have seen in Denver. Um, and, and now I want to kind of dig into the, to the data that supports or refutes this prediction of an urban coyote culture. Um, and so this is all going to be uh, data from, from Denver. And again, I, the, the reason I frame it in this, in this culture uh, idea is that it opens up a whole lot more data to us that we can look and apply to this, this issue. So the first two predictions I call would be more like conditions. Is there plentiful food supply in Denver? And then is there limited predation by people? Okay, then the third uh, is a prediction that there's a time lag between pioneer, uh, the pioneering period um, and when conflict emerges. So think back to that graph as the bar goes up, coy uh, coyotes are pioneering, and then conflict emerges. Um, we would predict that we'd see habitat imprinting for urban areas by coyotes. And we'd predict bolder behavior, um, more exploratory, risky behavior exhibited in coyotes, more aggressive uh, behavior. So let's start looking at some data. You're going to see this table. This is uh, here is just the different data sources. Um, here's the prediction associated with these data sources. And then here's, we're going to give a yes, no for the evidence. Abundant food sources for coyotes in the in Denver metro area? The answer is, of course, yes, but um, uh, and, and the evidence that we have for it is we have the food habits study showing us showing what the coyotes are eating, but we also have these home range sizes that shows us that there's plenty of food in the De Denver metro area. How do we infer that from home range sizes? Well, we can see that you know, they're, they're pretty small home range sizes relative to coyotes in different areas. So when you have uh, coyotes in areas with a little bit of food, their home range increases, their home range size increases. As there's more food, you see the home range shrinking. 
So um, these are fairly, in the literature, fairly small home ranges um, relative to other places. So um, prediction one, plentiful food supply in Denver metro area, the answer is yes. Um, prediction two, limited predation by people. We can look at city and state ordinances um, uh, and coyote mortality data to address this prediction. So trapping is illegal in Denver metro area. Hunting is essentially impossible, although it's legal to hunt coyotes. Um, the, the, the gun laws and, and ordinances um, prevent that from really happening at any man, uh, uh, significant level. Management of removal of coyotes is low, um, uh, and that's management by um, Parks and Wildlife and Wildlife Services personnel. Um, and if we look at our coyote mortality data that Sharon presented, we see the total number of mortality events, 14. Um, two radio collar animals were shot, which runs a little bit counter to what I'm saying, but this is um, uh, still a relatively low num amount of mortality for a coyote in, um, caused directly by people. So, limited predation by people, does the data support the prediction? I'd say yes. Um, prediction, there's a, a lag time uh, between the pioneering event and uh, period and then when conflict emerges. The, our best data comes out of the, um, our paper in 2013, which shows trends in, in coyote conflict over time. Uh, goes up to 2010, this is a half a year. You have to have a lot of skepticism about 2009. That's when people got really interested in this issue and there's a whole lot of press about coyotes. So we have reporting bias. We have a lot of issues with this data, but what we see is that early 2000s, really not any type of co reports about con uh, conflict with coyotes. Um, there's issues there too. It could be that people just weren't reporting it, as Andrew brought up, but I can make a pretty strong argument that conflict has kind of emerged in the late 2000s in, in, in the Denver metro area. Um, and that's backed up by what I hear about some of the managers saying. We also have Andrew's human dimensions data showing um, the different levels of, uh, of conflict. Um, problem with this data is it only goes back three years. Does it, so does, does this data support the prediction? Um, I'd say yes with a question mark. You know, we've got some, some issues. We don't know what's happened in the past. Um, and then also a question mark with the human dimensions data. But overall, um, yeah, I think it does support the prediction that there's a tag, time lag between pioneering period and when conflict emerges. Um, habitat and printing for urban areas. So I want to look at transient coyote movement, and Sharon's done some of that. I want to kind of uh, take another look at this, though. And here's all the transient coyotes. Sharon defined what a transient coyote was, which is basically an animal that doesn't have a home range, and so they, they show a lot of movement. The thing I want to point out here, again, this is the border of the Denver metro area as we defined it. You see all the movement going back in. You don't see coyotes going out of the Denver metro area. That's an indication of habitat imprinting. So an urban coyote likes the urban area. It's not leaving into the rural area. The exception may be this one, though on this area there's a lot of uh, um, uh, areas that I would call associated with the city. But I want to go into that case a little more, as Sharon did. Um, and we have to thank Jason Kofer and Justin Fisher with Wildlife Service who produced this map. Um, and so that's that map of that individual. Sharon talked about um, how this individual loved airports. So it was born on this Rocky Mountain National, or Rocky Mountain uh, Metropolitan Airport, um, dispersed over here, checked out Rocky Mountain Arsenal, didn't like it, a little too quiet there, kind of enjoyed the sound of airplanes flying over constantly um, around Denver uh, Metropolitan Airport, International Airport and the Front Range Airport. So this is another, it's an anecdotal uh, story about habitat and printing, but it's a good one. It really demonstrates that there might be something here. So, uh, habitat and printing for urban areas, does the data support the prediction? Yes. Our next prediction is boulder behavior in urban landscapes. So we can look at uh, uh, different data sources here. One is the citizen science reports that Mary Ann talked about. I've been spending the past week going through hundreds and hundreds of reports. Thanks, Mary Ann, for sleepless nights. Um, but uh, there's some really good stuff in here. And what, uh, what I want to do 
is, um, is simplify this scale. Just Marianne talked about how they recorded data. I kind of blacked it out. I don't want to get bogged in, down in the details, but what I want to um, highlight is that we have uh, coyotes that approach after a human input. So these are what we'd call bold coyotes, and then coyotes that uh, are running away. And that's sort of the, the, the scale that we're talking about. And so here's the scale down here, just to keep you guys on track. Um, so, um, and these bars represent um, 400 plus observations where the observers um, watch coyotes interact with people. It might have been an interaction between the coyote and the observer, or it might have been an, um, an interaction between a uh, coyote and another person that the observer was watching. But they were all relative to uh, people and coyotes. And there were different types of interactions. It might have been a person hazing the coyote, or it might have been just a passive um, inter encounter. So it's really a, a great da data. Um, and what it shows is you know, what we kind of expect from coyotes is you know, they, they have this type of um, response with the, the input of a person, where they're running away, or at least they're moving away quickly. What's surprising is the number of um, um, what we would call bold encounters um, from, from these pub public observations. You know, it's, it's in the range of uh, 20 or 30 uh, events where the coyote actually approached a person. So um, does this predict, uh, or does this bolder, um, so bolder behavior in an urban landscape, does the data predict or uh, support the prediction? For citizen science reports, yes, I would say for sure. Um, as we move into the next two predictions, I have to do a little bit of background here. And we're going to talk about two things, the flight initiation distance and novel objects tests. OK, so I will explain these. But uh, the key here is that we're comparing urban areas to rural areas. And we know about this. We've, we've talked about this, so I'll, I'll, I'll move over it quickly. But the rural area has a lot of human predation versus the urban area. So here's just some pictures of the study sites. Um, we compared, uh, you, you're really very familiar with the Denver metro area study now. Um, it's a beautiful place for sure in certain ways. Um, the Utah study area, I need to explain a little bit more. This was carried out by another graduate student from Utah State University. We had collar coyotes in this area. He's doing a, a coyote ecology program, but we utilized his collar coyotes to help us address those, the, these two tests. Also a beautiful area um, in its own way. So this is Peter doing some telemetry. Um, but we're going to talk about flight initiation distance. What that is, is the distance at which an animal flees when approached by a predator. Um, and it's used to, to measure bold, shy behavior um, very commonly in the literature. So the methods. Or you locate a coyote that is resting and you start walking towards it, all right? And you walk directly towards it, and at the point when the coyote moves, then you stop walking. This person is a poor technician because he didn't stop walking. <laughs> but when he does stop walking, you measure that distance, all right? The other thing that we measured, and this is the flight initiation distance, okay? The other thing we measure is the response of the coyote. What does the coyote do? How does it respond? Um, and then the final thing that we measured was the type of cover. And we're just defining cover as high, medium, and low. So here's, here's the results for the, for the distant component. Okay, so this is over here, we have distant, distance. Um, here is our cover classes, low, medium, and high. And here is the urban area versus the rural area. So this is the response of the coyotes. And all these were the collared coyotes that we did these tests on. Most of them, anyway. Um, what we see, first off, just a rough cut, you think, well, there's not a whole lot of difference between the urban and rural areas. I think that's a fair assessment. We haven't done the stats on it, but I don't think you're going to find a, a statistical, a significantly statistical difference in the distance. And that's an interesting point. And one of the things we started noticing is that, um, and actually a surprising result, but one of the things we noticed was in the, in the rural areas, um, when these coyotes, remember, we were waiting till they were bedded down, so they were not moving around. They were bedded down, and then we would approach them. And this may be a strategy for them is just to stay bedded down until that's too late, and they start running. 
because all my observations of coyotes in rural environments are a coyote running and I barely see them and they're half a mile away. That's what we were expecting. So a bit of a surprising result, um, and this is just an artificial trend line so I, you, know, you can help kind of compare. There may be something going on here. It looks like at these cover classes, you know, maybe a little bit lower than over here. Again, probably not statistically different. The other thing I want to point out, though, is that, wow, once you get in this low cover class in both these environments, you get a tremendous amount of variation. So it's almost like different individuals um, are, are really responding in, in really different ways. And I don't have a good explanation for that. So let's move on to the intensity of the response. Okay, so this is what they did after they got up. And, and the key here is that we, we looked at a lot of things. It's very similar to citizen science. We, were, we evaluated whether they're walking or running. Did they stop? How far did they travel? And we built that all into these three or these four classes. Four is a strong rep response where they're running fast, okay? Um, and here's a weak response where they may amble away and kind of look back at you and go, yeah, what's the big deal? Um, and here's the difference between urban and rural environments. Really big difference, right? Rural coyotes, once they start fleeing, they're going. Um, urban environments, you don't see that as much. In fact, you see sort of this very weak response in how they um, uh, move away from, from the person approaching them. So our prediction is bolder behavior in urban landscapes. Does the data support the prediction? I'd say yes and no. Um, uh, with the caveat on the no being, you know, there's, there's something about coyotes bedded down, and that's probably a mechanism for them to avoid um, being seen by people. So novel objects test. Um, this is a test that's used to, to, um, to look at exploratory behavior in coyotes, exploratory avo avoidance. And it's a, you put a novel stimuli out, and it elicits a behavior um, where the coyote is conflicted between avoiding it or exploring it, okay? And so we're basically kind of messing with the coyote's mind to see how it, um, it responds. And this was done in captivity at our Logan Field Station where we put out a traffic cone and we'd measure this response, okay? The thing that we were doing is we're measuring approaching behaviors. In, in, um, in our study, this is what it looks like. This is Sharon. She's uh, helping set up cameras. We put a T-post in. This is a camera here. Uh, uh, motion triggered camera and uh, 12 feet away we'd put a bait little bait pile right here to attract coyotes into this we did this so that we could get footage of the coyotes all right the novel object that we put out it started as a um, this series of four stakes with a uh, rope and flagging but the flagging was triggering the camera so we we're getting a bunch of video of nothing so we just cut the flagging off and as you'll see it was still a pretty interesting uh, novel object for these coyotes Here's just an example of the bait we put into this hole. Um, and then we put a, what we call a fatty acid tab on top of the grass plug just to help bring coyotes in. So the, the experimental design, again, we have the rural, urban area. Um, at each of the study areas, we put 15 control sites out, 15 treatment sites. Control sites have no novel object. Treatment sites have the novel object. And the trials lasted for two weeks. Here's just some example of a video get. Um, and this highlights some interesting things. First of all, you'll see there's no treatment here. There's no novel object. So this is just a control site. And you can see how that coyote responded. We're calling that, you know, we can start pulling out that behavior and we contrast it with this guy who just marches right in. You can look at its tail. You can look at ear position. You can look at how they crouch, a lot of different behaviors that we can pull out of this video. And we're still in the process of doing that. It's a long, laborious um, uh, job. And so I don't have uh, results, refined results for you. Um, but I can show you, a, a, um, I can try, contrast the control now with what the, a, a treatment might look like. Here you can see the coyote never getting to the bait piles right in here. Very interested in it. Um, but has this very this avoidance behavior, um, is very cautious, is very wary, and we can quantify all that. Very, you can see how they spook. Um, here's another a video from a rural area. Um, this is a control site, but I'm going to skip this just because of, uh, for time's sake. 
Here's what we're scoring with behaviors. We're scoring how far close they get to that bait pile. We're looking at how they, um, the type of behavior, especially investigating versus vigilant. We're using posture and tail, tail position to really score this behavior. But we're also collecting a lot of additional behaviors from shaking to digging to pawing, all these different behaviors. Um, and so this is just a very rough cut of the video, okay? Here we have urban control, urban treatment sites, rural control, rural treatment sites. All right, so let's kind of take a little bit of a look at these. First thing I want to compare is the urban control versus urban treatment. What you see is treatment has a big effect on these guys. Just these sticks were, was a big deal for these coyotes. All right, they reacted strongly. And that's indicative. Here's the total number of, of kind of um, behaviors we quantified from the urban control sites versus the treatment sites, a huge difference. Um, and um, the point I wanted to make on this um, uh, was that, that's becoming apparent with, especially within these urban control sites, is the process of habituation, which was unexpected for us. But as you go through time, and that's not depicted here, but as you go through time, we're able to see how the behavior changes, which is something really cool that we're getting out of this video. Um, that will also be um, indicative. But we see the same kind of pattern on these rural control sites versus rural treatment sites. Um, this is faded out, I apologize. It's a very low number for the treatment site. Um, for the for control site, it's, it's higher. You might ask, wow, there's a big difference between rural and, tr and, the, and the urban. Be cautious. At these rural sites, the coyote home range was seven times bigger than in the Denver area. Okay, so we're going to expect a huge difference. Um, still though, it, it, it is probably, and I'll compare that here, there probably is some type of difference between urban and rural, and the way you look at that is, is you start looking at what I'd call some of these comfort behaviors, um, urinating, defecating, rubbing, rolling, digging, eating and handling. You see a lot of that in this urban area. You see very little of that here in this rural control site, especially relative to these kind of more um, uh, behaviors indicative of fear, uh, running, and, and cautious. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna fine tune all this, um, get these results out, um, but it'll be a while. So more prone to take risk and explore novelty. I'd say the data supports that, and we'll move on to our final um, prediction: more aggressive behavior toward pets and people. Well, I think I think that's pretty clear. This is just another graph. Here's month. Um, it shows the pet attacks. Um, through, the, through months, and this was from the data we had from 2005 to 2010. Um, and, it, and it just shows that, you know, well, these human attacks are probably mostly related to, well, not probably, they are mostly related to uh, pets, and, uh, um, but still, there are some, some human attacks that are occurring that are not in this, but point being here, I think the data speaks for itself. There are, there's a lot more aggression, a lot more, uh, uh, coyotes or, or more events where coyotes are uh, uh, behaving bold and aggressively towards pets and people. Um, we don't really have reports from rural areas to, to compare and contrast with our urban areas and uh, it's something that actually Mary and I, Mary Ann and I are working on with the citizen science, see if we can get people to give us reports from rural areas. That would really help bolster this case, uh, but until we get there we're left with this, but I would say yes, the data does, and does very much support the prediction that um, um, we have more aggressive behavior towards pets and people. So in conclusion, um, I'd argue that we have an urban culture that is developed in the Denver metro area. And it's the result of humans becoming less relevant to coyotes. And, and an inevitable outcome of this is that you're gonna have older and more aggressive coyotes. And I will, again, I'll talk about the management implications um, in my last talk. So let's take a break. And to, if you need some encouragement on this break, watch this last video. And, uh, and we'll see you in 10 minutes, okay? Just don't pee on your neighbor.